Okay, welcome back to the 2S Horror Quarters podcast for another true crime episode that is about 50 miles east of the East Los Angeles area into Riverside, the city of Riverside particularly. And we're going to get into the case of the unsolved murder of Sherry Jo Bates. The body of Sherry Jo Bates was found on October 31st, 1966, approximately 6.32 in the morning on the grounds of Riverside City College. To this day, it is unsolved, and it is still gaining national attention. It is still a very popular topic, primarily because of its potential attachment to the Zodiac. A lot of people believe that this is Zodiac's first kill, first murder. I mean, a lot of people don't believe it, but a lot of people do. Uh, The Sherry Jo Bates case was mentioned in the movie Zodiac, starring Jake Gyllenhaal and Robert Downey Jr., so... We're going to delve into that case a bit to try and maybe figure this thing out. Just about three weeks ago when we were still working on this particular episode, the Press Enterprise put out an article stating that an anonymous donor pledged $50,000 for a reward into this unsolved murder of Sherry Jo Bates. So I guess now is, is a good time to finish this and get this out. Maybe it'll jog a few memories. Perhaps somebody, though it's going to be almost 55 years, well, it'll be 55 years on October 31st, but maybe this will jog someone's memory. You know, maybe somebody will actually talk now and maybe lead to an arrest or at least lead to some kind of information as to who did it, how, why, so on and so forth. I wanted to get into Sherry Jo Bates' movements on the day before her body was found, and this would be October 30th, 1966. Now, based on witness accounts and police reports, what we do know is that Sherry and her father attended Mass at St. Catherine's Church, which is a nearby church. After Mass, they went to eat at a restaurant called Sandy's. All this was nearby in close proximity to each other. After breakfast, Joseph heads to the beach area. Sherry most likely went home. Sometime in the mid-afternoon, Sherry reached out to one of her co-workers to ask about a term paper. Sometime around that same time, Sherry reaches out to a second friend to invite her to the library to join her. That second friend declined. Joseph returns around 5 p.m. And when he gets there, he notices that Sherry's gone, but she did leave a note pinned to the refrigerator, which said Dad went to RCC Library. Joseph, at some point, leaves the house again and leaves a note for his daughter himself. When he returns to the house around midnight, he sees that the note is unmoved The house still looks the same, so most likely it has not been read. He wasn't quite as concerned at this point, so he goes to sleep, wakes up in the morning, and Sherry is still not there. Now he's extremely concerned. He reaches out to one of her friends. One of her friends has no clue where Sherry's at, so now Joseph calls the police department. And it was a little bit after this that a groundskeeper at Riverside City College named Cleophas Martin, while on his street sweeper, came across the body of Sherry, She was laying face down on a gravel pathway driveway in between two vacant homes. So here's one of the original crime scene photos. You can see Sherry's body there to the right. I have it blurred out a touch. But the gravel driveway that we're looking at intersects that alley there. And to the right of that, right where it intersects and tees, you can see Sherry laying there. To the left, where you see the detective and the officer there, is one of the annex homes that was vacant that would be used by the library to house excess library books and across the gravel pathway there you can see the second house which was also vacant now the camera itself is facing away from the football field so the back of the photographer is facing the scoreboard that you will see in the reverse pictures of Sherry Lane there and then across from Terracina is the scoreboard and the football field Here's a Google Earth shot of where Sherry lived and the distance between her home and RCC. Now in this straight line there, we're not running through all the streets that get there, but just a straight line across, you can see how close it was to the college. 2.98 miles, we'll just call it three miles from RCC to Sherry's home. Here is a current aerial shot from Google Earth of RCC. I may have cut off some of the campus. I don't think I did, but I may have. But as you can see now, it's a very large campus. And 
from this perspective, this is where the crime scene was right here. So here is the intersection of Magnolia and Terracina. So facing Terracina, if you make a right, you will head onto campus there. And if you were to make a left from this angle, you would walk up this sidewalk here. And this sidewalk going up Terracina leads right to the crime scene and to the library. And to the right here is also the general area of the former Shelly Lynn Apartments. And here we are with some aerial footage of RCC now as it stands in 2021. Here we're on Terracina Drive and the library at the time was on the Terracina Drive of the Quadrangle to the right. Shout out and much thanks to Jose Gomez on the aerial footage. Did another incredible job for us. It's been reported that the Sandy's restaurant, the former Sandy's restaurant where Sherry and her father Joseph ate on October 30th, 1966, was at 5201 Arlington Avenue. Now it's been said that this parking lot here where the Starbucks is, is the parking lot that Sandy's once stood. But I looked into it a little deeper and directly across the street is the odd side of the address. So 5201 would be across the street here in this large parking lot of this vacant Sears building. The Sandy's restaurant probably sat right here in this parking lot somewhere. Now I could be wrong, it could be across the street where that Starbucks is, but based on what the addresses say now, and I know it's 55 years later, the odd addresses would be across the street here in this wide open parking lot. Here we are at 3564 Central Avenue in Riverside, California. This is the Hayden Building now, but this was the Riverside National Bank where Sherry worked. Here we are at St. Catherine of Alexandria Church at 3680 Arlington Avenue, Riverside, California. This is the church that Sherry and her father Joseph attended the morning of October 30th, 1966. And this is also the church where Sherry's funeral services were held. Sherry was laid to rest at Crestline Memorial Park on November 4th, 1966. Years later, for reasons unknown, Sherry's family had her exhumed, cremated, and spread her ashes out to sea. So let's get to the timeline on the RCC campus. We do know that the library was open from 6 to 9. Now there was a male student who actually knew Sherry, and he said he arrived around 5.30 p.m., waiting for the library to open. Once he walked in, it was then that he noticed Sherry inside, specifically writing in a blue spiral notebook. The library is said to be small and cramped at the time. So based on what I've seen, anyone that's there is probably going to be seen by anybody else that's there. A second male, a librarian, claimed to also have seen Sherry inside the library around this time. Between 6.10 and 6.15, a friend of Sherry's claims to have seen her driving on Magnolia towards RCC. The friend waved. Sherry didn't wave back probably because she didn't see her. A military man, described as an Air Force man, claims to have seen Sherry as well, driving up an alley parallel to the library, and followed by maybe what appeared to be a 1960 Oldsmobile. Now logically, I know the times mentioned don't really jive up or add up based on the two library witnesses who 
said they saw her a little earlier. I kind of attribute that to just missed times. You know, times can be off by a few minutes here and there. So I still believe that the two males at the library did see Sherry. I just think the times are off somewhere between them and the girl who saw Sherry driving on Magnolia, as well as the military man. Between 6.30 and 6.40 p.m., there were some friends of Sherry's that were already inside of the library, and they claimed they did not see her at all. And again, this was a small library. We do know that Sherry checked out three books from the library as they were found in her car on the passenger seat. Between 7.15 and 9 p.m., another friend of Sherry's by the name of Walter Siebert, he was already inside of the library with some other friends. They all said they did not see Sherry in that timeline. So that's an hour and 45 minutes that they were there. Now it's 9 p.m. Library closes and students exit. No one reports seeing Sherry leaving, but they do report that her vehicle is still there. Now also around 7.15, there were four men hanging out at the fence across and near where Sherry parked her vehicle. They were dressed in work clothes. These four men were questioned by the police and said they did see Sherry near her car around 6 p.m. It's to be noted that these four men did not see anyone approach her vehicle, approach Sherry, tamper with her car, or anything like that. They also didn't see her walking with anyone. Now remember Walter Siebert, who was at the library between 7.15 and 9 o'clock. He said he saw the men there at 7.15 across from Sherry's car, so they were still there at 7.15, but these four men did not see Sherry past, I think, 6 o'clock, somewhere along there. The library closes and the students exit. No one reports seeing Sherry Jo Bates leave. Her car was still there and the way it was parked, at least the way that I interpreted the information, her car was parked facing the library. So I would guess her driver's side door was to the concrete. Uh, this isn't confirmed. This is just based on my interpretation of what my research told me. Sherry drove a 1960 lime green VW Beetle or Bug parked directly behind her beetle some witnesses said they saw a tucker torpedo vehicle now the tucker torpedo this is where it gets a little tricky there were only 51 of those made total before the company itself folded and i think they folded in 1951 so to see that torpedo there uh, though it's possible it's probably not as probable so Authorities suggested that because the torpedo resembles a Studebaker champion, the front end of it does, that perhaps it was a Studebaker champion that was parked behind her vehicle. The Studebaker champion may very well not be associated with any crime at all. It might have been just somebody parked there. So let's move on to 930. There's a female student walking on that alley, passing that gravel pathway where Sherry's body was found. And she claims to have seen a man standing there smoking a cigarette in the dark, in the shadows. I guess they nodded or maybe had a small, quick hello to each other, and the student kept walking. So police confirmed her story because they did find a cigarette butt in that alley. If this was the man responsible for Sherry's murder, was she already dead at that point? It was 9.30, and he was just tucking her away, so... No one would see. Maybe he heard the, the female student approaching, so he just had to pretend he was just standing there normally smoking a cigarette. Maybe Sherry was still alive and he had gagged her somehow, or maybe she was unconscious at that point. Now, if Sherry was in the restraints from this man smoking a cigarette at 9.30, this would make the most sense because the witnesses between 10.15 and 10.40 p.m. at the nearby Shelley Lynn apartments, there was two witnesses that claimed to have heard a scream between 10.15 and 10.45. One witness said they heard a scream, then a couple of minutes of silence, then an older vehicle start up and take off. A second witness said that they heard a scream, a woman's scream, at about 10.30. In my opinion, if Sherry was subdued by this guy in the alley there smoking a cigarette, uh, maybe she came to around 10.15, 10:30, and then he actually did kill her at that point in which in turn we would hear the screams and then approximately 6 30 a.m the next morning halloween morning cleophas martin found her cleophas was a groundskeeper at rcc this area to the right here is the entrance into the quadrangle area and also would have led you to where the library would have been 
And to the left there, you can see the general area where the four men were hanging out on October 30th across from where Sherry parked. Sherry parked right about here. And right about here roughly is where the four men were hanging out. And here are some other angles of those two locations just so you can see from a different viewpoint of where the car was parked and the approximate area of the four men. So I found these reference photos here from a 1955 to 1956 RCC catalog. A nice aerial shot. Now I don't know what year these were taken because this same photo has appeared in other years. But the earliest I found was this one here from 1955 to 56. And well, you can see here the two annex houses. You can see one complete house and then you see like a portion of the next house. And Sherry was found right in between here. Here's another angle of the quadrangle from the 1954 to 1955 catalog. Again, I don't know what year that is, but I kind of get caught up in trying to find precise and accurate areas pertaining to these crimes. One thing that's confused me though and I can't really figure out is as to where Sherry parked her vehicle. Now I know it's been documented and it's been said she parked here but from these photos it doesn't appear that anyone is parking on Terracina as you can see. It doesn't mean they didn't, it doesn't mean they don't on Sundays when it's just the library open, maybe they did, but from these photos here you can see around the corner from Terracina there's some parking along the wall and there's a parking area here. And here are a couple of comparisons from what I found in the catalogs in the 50s to present day 2021. Now let's talk about the crime scene area itself and what police found. Starting with Sherry's vehicle. Police found newly checked out library books sitting on Sherry's passenger front seat. There was three books. Her driver's side door was left ajar. I don't know how far ajar, but maybe wide open. And the car had definitely been tampered with. So police found that one wire connected to the distributor was disconnected. There was greasy handprints on the outside of the panel of the trunk. So obviously somebody came and opened it up fiddled with her her engine there pulled a wire and according to police and what they deduced is that the perpetrator after he pulled the wire hid in the shadows or hid somewhere in there and waited for sherry to start her vehicle and then perhaps he walked up to her then when he can hear her turning the engine or turning the key over hey you need help and then that's how maybe he broke the ice which is a, a valid theory it's a fair theory. To me, it makes the most sense, especially if that wire was disconnected. Ten feet from Sherry's body was a wristwatch. The wristwatch appeared to be torn off of the individual, and it would fit a seven-inch wrist. Most likely broken off from the struggle, the wristwatch also had flecks of white house paint on it. Yeah, here's a photo of detectives searching the ivy there. It was reported that one of the groundsmen there on campus found a knife in the ivy. I haven't confirmed that, but you can definitely see them scouring through the ivy. On the History Channel's The Hunt for the Zodiac Killer, the current detective on the case, Detective Jim Simons, allowed the crew to look at this plaster mold of the boot print lifted from the crime scene that morning, and it is said to have been an 8 to 10 size military issued boot. Now, being that the window was halfway rolled down and it was nighttime, one theory would be to me is that Sherry got in the vehicle, tried to start the car up, it would not start. She locked the door either before or after she realized she had a problem. And then this man walks over to her driver's side. Maybe she can see him approaching from that alleyway. And she didn't want to unlock the door at first, so maybe she rolls down the window halfway just to talk to this guy because she was still kind of on edge. Maybe he startled her, whatever the case may be. It just appears to me that she rolled the window down 
after she exited the library. And that would make the most sense to me is that she didn't recognize this stranger coming up to her, her car, at least until more light shined on him. Autopsy findings. Dr. Renee Modglin is the doctor that performed the autopsy on Sherry and it was Halloween day that he did so. A direct quote from Dr. Renee Modlin was, the state of rigor mortis, post-mortem lividity and body temperature at 923, 31st October 1966, indicated she had been dead between nine and 12 hours. In the Inside Detective Magazine, November of 1968 edition, there was a piece written by John Montgomery covering Sherry's case. It was two years removed from the actual murder. And to me, the closer the information to the actual crime would seem to be more accurate than information passed down over the 55 years. So I'm going to read here what John Montgomery wrote in regards to the autopsy. Dr. Renee Modlin, a famed autopsy surgeon and pathologist under contract to the coroner's office, was summoned to the scene of the crime. He performed a partial autopsy on the spot. The autopsy revealed that the 5 feet 3 inch 110 pound girl had been slashed three times across the throat. One savage slash had severed the jugular vein. She had also been stabbed twice, once in the chest and once under the left shoulder blade. Her once pretty face had been slashed across the left cheek and upper lip. Sherry's autopsy report is extensive. And if you go to ZodiacCiphers.com, they break it down really well. There were wounds on her face, her breasts, her back, and including her throat. So it was vicious. It is my belief that between 1015 and 1040, that was Sherry screaming. So the fatal slash was the slash of her jugular vein in her neck. Apart from all of these multiple injuries, these slashes and cuts, she was also kicked in the head. So it was very, very violent. 9.23 p.m. to 12.23 a.m., which again lines up with the theory that perhaps she was killed or the attack took place somewhere after 10. And she put up quite a fight. There was skin under her fingernails as well as hair clenched in her right fist. And from that, it was concluded that her attacker was a white male. And here is Detective Steve Shumway, who is now retired. He was on the case in the 90s and as he mentioned in that episode the campus has changed drastically over the 55 year period over the years there's been some different diagrams and different discussions as far as where the location of sherry was when she was found the actual crime scene and it wasn't until recently that doing some more digging i found those aerial photos of rcc from probably the 50s that I talked about earlier because initially I thought the crime scene was probably 20 to 30 feet away from where I found that it was so as you can see here in these photos the proximity of the crime scene was right about here but for me just to be in this vicinity and covering this topic, covering this case, I can put my own eyes to it, my own ears to it, and just get a sense of how I envisioned how that night went. Whatever thoughts, you know, it's multiple thoughts, multiple theories, but just to kind of take it all in. And uh, me and the fellows met out here, and Jose was on controls to get this beautiful aerial coverage, and even bringing it home, looking at everything we've got. It just allows you to to think more at, at the possibilities. But at any rate, here we are near the library entrance and where Sherry parked, where the four men were hanging out across the street from Sherry in the, in the general vicinity. So it for me, it helps build things in my mind as far as what happened. On November 29th of that same year, Riverside PD receives what they called and what was titled the confession. This was a letter typed on carbon paper and it was deduced that it was typed on a stack of carbon paper and and the copy mailed to PD was somewhere near the bottom of the stack and this makes it virtually 
untraceable, untrackable. So at any rate, the confession reads as follows. The confession. She was young and beautiful, but now she is battered and dead. She is not the first, and she will not be the last. I lay awake nights thinking about my next victim. Maybe she will be the beautiful blonde that babysits near the little store and walks down the dark alley each evening about seven. Or maybe she will be the shapely blue-eyed brownette that said no when I asked her for a date in high school. But maybe it will not be either. But I shall cut off her female parts and deposit them for the whole city to see. But don't make it too easy for me. Keep your sisters, daughters, and wives off the streets and alleys. Miss Bates was stupid. She went to the slaughter like a lamb. She did not put up a struggle, but I did. It was a ball. I first pulled the middle wire from the distributor. Then I waited for her in the library and followed her out after about two minutes. The battery must have been about dead. By then I then offered to help. She was then very willing to talk with me. I told her that my car was down the street and that I would give her a lift home. When we were away from the library walking, I said it was about time. She asked me about time for what? I said it was about time for her to die. I grabbed her around the neck with my hand over her mouth and my other hand with a small knife at her throat. She went very willingly. Her breast felt very warm and firm under my hands. But only one thing was on my mind making her pay for the brush-offs that she had given me during the years prior. She died hard. She squirmed and shook as I choked her, and her lips twitched. She let out a scream once, and I kicked her head to shut her up. I plunged the knife into her, and it broke. I then finished the job by cutting her throat. I am not sick. I am insane. But that will not stop the game. This letter should be published for all to read it. It just might save that girl in the alley, but that's up to you. It will be on your conscience, not mine. Yes, I did make that call to you also. It was just a warning. Beware. I am stalking your girls now. CC, Chief of Police, Enterprise. And the letter spoke of details of the crime. Now, it very well could be the perpetrator very well could be the killer but at the same time the media had already released details of this crime that very week even the very next day and the day after so it also could have been someone that read the paper that decided to write this confession letter during this time there was a man of interest a person of interest that the police were looking into but it wasn't enough to arrest him I came across an interesting thought from FBI profiler John Douglas regarding the crime and I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit. According to John Douglas, the crime scene was left in some disarray. There was no attempt to clean anything up. And it also appeared that Sherry put up more of a fight than the perpetrator expected. And because of this, John Douglas thinks that the perpetrator was young and or an unsophisticated killer. Not a true disorganized personality. Now that very well could be true. But it also could have been he's okay with leaving that stuff behind because even in 1966 there were no cameras, no cell phones to take any kind of surveillance of the crime and DNA wasn't even a thing then. I mean, yeah, it was collected, but it really wasn't a thing so maybe the killer didn't really care about this type of stuff. In December of 1966, a custodian at RCC found a poem written on top of a wooden desk. Police documented it, took photos of it, so forth. Another thing that John Douglas mentioned was that anniversaries of crimes tend to stir up more emotions from people, from the perpetrator, from the witnesses. So when the Riverside Press Enterprise wrote a story on it six months after the crime, three letters were sent out from someone. One arrived at the Riverside Press Enterprise, one arrived at Riverside Police Department, and one arrived at Joseph Bates' house. There was a renowned handwriting expert by the name of Sherwood Morrill, and he worked in the Question Documents Department of the Bureau of Criminal Identification and Investigation, and he was directly associated with the Zodiac case. So Paul Avery is able to get those three letters, the one to Joseph Bates, the one to the Press Enterprise, and the one to Riverside PD, to Sherwood Morrill. And from that, Mr. Morrill 
deduce that those three letters, as well as the famous desktop poem, as well as all of the other correspondence from Zodiac, or from allegedly Zodiac, that they all came from the same author. In regards to suspects, Riverside Police Department had a guy that they called Bob Barnett. They didn't want to give his real name at the time. And they were looking at him because, according to witnesses and reports, he had some type of relationship with Sherry. Sherry ended up getting engaged to a guy named Dennis Highland. And according to reports, she had to break the news to this Bob guy. And that caused some rift between the two. Shortly before Sherry's death, it had been reported that Bob and Sherry got into a very heated argument publicly in front of people. And she called out to him when him and some buddies were playing basketball. And according to a witness, Bob said that bitch is going to the library. There was also a witness that said shortly after Sherry was murdered that they saw two men or two individuals in the dark with flashlights in that area as if they were looking for something. Police seemed to believe it was Bob and his best friend. Now, his best friend took a polygraph and failed. Bob clammed up and didn't finish his test. In the early 90s, Bob's friend admitted that at around 2.30 a.m. at a restaurant called The Green Turtle, Bob asked him to go with him back to RCC to recover an item. A second friend also told police that Bob was sobbing shortly after the murder and saying, quote unquote, he snuffed Sherry. Bob, shortly after Sherry's murder, moved out of the country. In December of 1998, Bob returned to the country. Authorities got wind of that. And they got a warrant to get his DNA. So they got saliva, blood, whatever else you get for DNA, and compared it to the DNA at the crime scene, and it was not a match. It was conclusively not a match. Doesn't mean he wasn't there, doesn't mean he didn't commit the crime, but it means that his DNA was not at RCC. Something else that the Inside Detective Edition covered and, and talked about was there were two girls that knew Sherry being interviewed by a, a television guy or a crew and they said that Sherry told them that she was going to the library to meet her boyfriend. Now her boyfriend was cleared, his alibi checked out as he was up in San Francisco. I noticed that a lot of people have been critical of the Riverside Police Department over the years on this case. I'm not going to criticize the Riverside Police Department. You know, I would like to think that they've been working hard on the case and we don't know things that go on behind closed doors. There might be some information that they really can't release. So for me, I'd like to think that they're doing their best to this day in finding who killed Sherry. There was a theory by investigators that this person was local because he was familiar with the grounds. He was familiar with the two houses being vacant. And that could very well be true. That's a solid theory. But at the same time, when you do something as illogical as, as murder someone like they did Sherry, you're not always thinking about logic, about who sees what. I mean, obviously you don't want anyone to see you, but it very well could have been that's where they got into this argument at right there, and that's where the rage came out right there. There was another guy named Ross Sullivan. Now, Ross Sullivan had become the topic of conversation in the History Channel's series, The Hunt for the Zodiac Killer. They uh, were looking at him hard. He worked at RCC Library. He was a big guy, 6'3", 300 pounds. Uh, he wore wing walker shoes. And remember, there was a military style shoe footprint, boot print at the crime scene. And it was indented into the ground as if the person had some weight on him. According to reports, Ross enjoyed taking English classes. He enjoyed cryptography. Um, he was a notoriously bad speller. Apparently, after Sherry died, he stayed away for multiple weeks, up to six weeks, and changed into different attire now. Wasn't coming to work in the same gear. So after those three letters were sent out to Joseph Bates, the Riverside PD, and Riverside Press Enterprise, Ross moved to Santa Cruz, California. And in 1968, he was arrested for indecent exposure. Ross died in 1977 at the age of 36. They said he had been extremely obese and he succumbed to heart failure. So in the movie Zodiac, there is a scene, a small scene, where Sherry Jo Bates in that case is mentioned. Well, Paul Avery, played by Robert Downey Jr., was 
a writer for the San Francisco Chronicle, and he was covering the Zodiac murders. Well, the Zodiac sent Paul a Halloween card with a skeleton on the front of it. Shortly after that, Avery received a letter from someone that suggested they take a look at the Sherry Jo Bates case because it has a lot of similarities to the Zodiac case, and that this person felt that the authorities were brushing him off. So Avery took a look at it, saw some similarities, enough to say, hey, wait a minute, this could be something. And behind investigators' backs up north on the Zodiac case, he had conversation and communication with Riverside authorities about the case, so that pissed off the detectives up north, so it was a whole thing. Some of the similarities in the confession letter to the Zodiac letters were the use of the words choked and twitched and squirmed. Not to mention there was a little Z. Could be a two, could be a Z at the bottom of these two letters in Riverside. And remember, Zodiac did the same type of thing, same type of initial. So it could be, it also could be the Zodiac playing games. You know, he also took credit for the Riverside killing in a later letter. It also could have been somebody just writing these letters as some kind of sick joke. I mean, you never really know. And an update to this just recently, in April of 2016, which was like five years ago, another letter came in to Riverside PD, and it came from a guy that said that was him that wrote those three letters to the Riverside PD, Riverside Enterprise, and Joseph Bates, and that he was a troubled youth, troubled teen back then, and he was responsible for doing so, and he's sorry for doing that. So it has been confirmed. I'm going to read you the information that was sent out to the public regarding that letter that came in from April 2016. So it says, In April 2016, investigators received an anonymous letter postmarked from San Bernardino, California. This letter was typed and appeared to have been generated from a computer. The author of the anonymous letter admitted to writing the handwritten letters. The author apologized for sending the letters and said it was a sick joke and admitted that he was not the Zodiac killer or the killer of Sherry Jo Bates and was just looking for attention. In 2020, the Homicide Cold Case Unit and the FBI Los Angeles Investigative Genealogy Team submitted the stamp from that letter for additional DNA analysis and subsequent interviews were conducted. The individual linked to the DNA evidence on the stamp admitted to writing the letter and sending it to Riverside Police Department. The author was a young teenager at the time and had a troubled youth. He said he wrote the letter seeking attention and was remorseful for his actions. Investigators confirmed the person was not involved in the murder of Sherry Jo Bates or involved in the murders associated with the Zodiac Killer. Additional information was developed regarding a separate set of letters sent to Northern California police agencies. The author claimed to be the Zodiac Killer, but the author ultimately admitted to sending the letters to keep the investigation going. So it was March 13th, 1971. A letter arrives at LA Times, postmark from Pleasanton, Alameda County, and it was allegedly from the Zodiac, claiming and taking responsibility for the Sherry Jo Bates murder in Riverside. This is the letter in full. This is the Zodiac speaking like I have always said. I am crack proof. If the blue meanies are ever going to catch me, they had best get off of their fat asses and do something because the longer they fiddle and fart around, the more slaves I will collect for my afterlife. I do have to give them credit for stumbling across my riverside activity, but they are only finding the easy ones. There are a hell of a lot more down there. The reason I'm writing to the Times is this. They don't bury me on the back pages like some of the others. And as you can see, he uses a plus symbol instead of the word end, and he misspelled always and ever. Some of the similarities were that Zodiac sent correspondence to both authorities as well as the local newspapers covering that case. The victims from the Zodiac were majority college-aged. The author of those letters also used words such as squirm and twitch. He also began sentences with but and or. And he also used double postage when he sent these letters. My pushback on the double postage is sometimes people do that to make sure that whatever you're sending gets to where it's going. Being that there was no return address, 
you're going to make sure that the postage gets there. So I don't know if that really means anything. Both letters reference the murders as the game. The desktop poem reads as follows. Cut. Clean. If read. Clean. Blood spurting. Dripping. Spilling. All over her new dress. Oh well. It was red anyway. Life draining into an uncertain death. She won't die. This time someone will find her. Just wait till next time. R.H. There was a theory about the desktop poem that I kind of likened to, to making sense, in that it was unrelated to Sherry's murder, in that it could have been related to another stabbing on the same campus, Riverside City College. And it was April 13th, 1965, a guy by the name of Rollin Lynn Taft stabbed a student down by the Cutter Pool area at RCC, last name Atwood. I don't have her first name here. He ended up stabbing her and he got caught for the crime. That desktop poem could have very well been related to that, written by him, written by someone that heard about the case that wanted attention for that case. But what happened in that case was this student by the last name of Atwood was walking on campus and Taft kept driving by asking her, hey, do you want to ride? And she declined. And from that, he attacked her. Almost immediately after Sherry's body was found, the school made some changes, particularly to that alleyway and to that gravel pathway. They cleared a lot of the brush there, and they added some lights. Riverside Police Department held a recreation of the night of October 30th, 1966, the night she was murdered, and got everybody back, or tried to get everybody back to the library in their same cars, in their same clothes, parked in their same parking areas just to try to get fresh eyes on the crime which is a smart thing to do to try to see what maybe they could have missed during that time according to reports there were two people that did not show for the recreation it doesn't mean that they are guilty it doesn't mean that they are innocent but according to reports there were two people that did not show this case has been studied quite extensively over the years its potential link to Zodiac, as well as the unsolved element, has led to a vast amount of information based on witness accounts, evidence, publications, and hearsay. And all of this expands some 55 years at this point. Your research may have led you into different accounts and interpretation. Any differing information or opinions regarding this case is not intended to undercut anyone else's opinion based on the information that they have. Whether or not you believe Zodiac committed this murder, to me it's more important to find out the truth. I really appreciate everyone that has liked, commented, and subscribed to the channel. To me, it just gets more eyes on these cases, especially the unsolved ones. You never know. But thank you again, and we will see you soon.